right, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our forum speaker for today, Dr. Mike Dietz. He's an associate professor of earth and environment at Boston University. He did his PhD at Duke University with Dr. Jim Clark, and he's the founding director of the Ecological Forecasting Initiative and wrote the book on ecological forecasting. So with that, Mike, take it away. Thanks. Thank you all, and, uh, and it's not very often that, that I, I get to benefit from the fact that, that Neon actually spent their money to make a trailer for my talks. <laughs> not why they make it, but it essentially is the trailer. Uh, feel like useful to give that plug. I do, I do want to say, uh, despite the weather, it's really a, a pleasure uh, uh, to be down here. Um, as someone who lived in North Carolina for 11 years, it, it is kind of feel like coming back home, uh, and it's just great. To, get the chance to meet all of you and, and hear a lot about all the cool stuff that's going on here. Uh, based on chats with everyone, I wonder if I even need to give this talk because I feel like a lot of folks are already uh, kind of on the same wavelength. Um, but I will. You know, I'm here anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to divide uh, this talk into kind of three parts. Uh, first, kind of a maybe a call to arms. Why? Why should ecologists care about forecasting? Why, why is that something we should think about doing? Uh, why is it important? Uh, I'm going to dive in the middle part to a little bit of, of theory, thinking about predictability as a concept, and, and potentially a unifying concept to think about how to bring different parts of our discipline together, uh, and then end a bit with you know, what I think is kind of the vision and challenges uh, for this community moving forward. Uh, before I get, dive into kind of the why, I also want to start with a little bit of definition just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, I tend to use uh, forecasting as an umbrella term that encompasses both, both projections and predictions. Uh, importantly, both of these are probabilistic, so they're not just a matter of running a model once and saying, aha, it'll be exactly 25 in the future with no uncertainty. Uh, because that forecast will always be wrong. Uh, but we're going to separate uh, the idea of a prediction, which is a, a forecast of what we think will happen in the future based on what we know now, from a projection that which will be based on some set of scenarios. And I, I use forecasting to encompass both, so it's not exclusive. Um, we're very familiar with both these concepts, I think, in terms of you know, the weather uh, forecast is a is a prediction. It's an extrapolation based on what we know, and our, our climate projections are projections. They're conditional on uh, scenarios for emissions. Uh, that said, I also want to emphasize that projections are not exclusively long-term things. You know, if you're interested in, in short-term uh, management decisions, you may be running very short-term projections under different uh, alternative choices that you might be making on a you know. You know, annual to subseasonal basis, or even shorter time scales. So, why forecast? It, in my mind, it comes down to kind of two major arguments that I think are really synergistic. Uh, the first is that decisions are fundamentally about the future, what we think will happen in the future. And if environmental scientists broadly, and ecologists specifically, want to make our science relevant, one way we can do that is to say, to, to provide our best quantitative estimate of what we actually think will happen in the future, which is essentially a forecast. You know, it's, it's putting our money where our mouth is. This is what we think will happen. Uh, I'll also say that I think that argument is becoming one that's progressively more and more urgent because a lot of the historical norms behind uh, the, a lot of environmental management uh, you know, that's taught in natural resources is based on this idea of stationarity or equilibrium, that you know, there's a 100-year flood or historical species range distributions that you were trying to restore something to its previous conditions. Um, but we are decidedly living in a non-equilibrium world. We are in a, a world of transients, and we will be in a world of transients for the rest of all of our careers, regardless of what we do about climate. It, we, we've baked in too much change. Uh, and so in that world of transients, you can't just rely on historical averages and historical ranges and stuff like that. The forecasts are really critical for actually being able to make management decisions in a, in a world that is constantly changing underneath our feet. Um, I'll also 
met the, make the point that I, I think that what I've experienced uh, is that most of the work that is being done in ecological forecasting right now uh, tends to be focused on these long-term projections, you know, decadal to centennial scale responses uh, to climate change. Uh, and I think there's this real unmet need to think about uh, uh, forecasts on shorter time scales, uh, where a lot of management decisions are actually being made. This, this particular set of data comes from a stakeholder survey related to NASA's carbon monitoring program, but I think the, it's, it's indicative of, of a more general uh, pattern across environmental management. You know, managers make decisions on these time scales. You know, they aren't making decisions based on 2100. Um, the other thing I'll note is that I, I've spent probably 20 years of my life making projections to 2100. I've, I've done a lot of work uh, with terrestrial carbon cycle models, particularly you know, in the last decade, working with the models that are, are, are global in extent and form the, the land component of global Earth system models. And um, you know, one of the things that's, that's I've noticed is, you know, there, there's a considerable amount of uncertainty in our, our future projections. You know, we don't agree on the sign. Uh, the magnitude is, the range of variability is comparable to anthropogenic emissions. And from one round to another, we don't seem to be reducing that spread. And even if we did reduce the spread, we don't actually even know which of these is going to be right. And w one of the things that I've kind of come to realize in, in recent years is, despite doing this for, for decades, I don't know if I've gotten any better at it. And the reason I don't know if I've gotten any better at it is because I've never been to 2100 to validate if I'm any good at predicting to 2100, nor will I ever which is a fundamental limitation of long-term projections. By contrast, if I predict, predict what I think is going to happen next week, I will know whether I'm right or wrong next week. Um, so if we look across the sciences more broadly, or even non-scientific discipline, if we look across any discipline that has developed a culture of forecasting, um, one of the things that's key to that is this idea of getting feedback. Forecast should be updated when new data becomes available. We should, uh, we make a prediction, we see what happens, we adjust our predictions, we, we adjust our understanding of the system, and we confront uh, our models of how we think the world works with data on a more frequent cycle. So instead of, you know, writing a three-year proposal, and at the end of that three-year grant, I confront my, you know, my field data with with my hypotheses, I'm con I want to be confronting data with hypotheses on a continual basis. I want to accelerate the pace at which we confront models with reality, because uh, we have to, because the needs of society are, are genuinely that urgent. We, you know, business as usual is not going to get us to where society needs us to be if we want to make our science relevant. Uh, so this is the sort of stuff that my lab's doing this, these days. These are, are uh, forecasts of leaf off. Uh, they are uh, driven by uh, climate, but informed uh, and updated every single day and re-predicted <coughs> based on a combination of, of field data coming from uh, phenocams and remotely sensed data coming from MODIS. Um, and yeah, we, we have an you know, automated system that is genuinely making a forecast every single day of the year. That said, the ones in the middle of winter and middle of summer aren't particularly interesting. Uh, for phenology, but <laughs> the system is still always running and always updating your understanding. Uh, and this isn't just something that I'm doing. These, these sorts of ecological forecasts are starting to bubble up across the discipline in, in different pockets. Uh, and so here are some, some examples that highlight some water-focused projects. Uh, folks at NOAA uh, Monterey office have this great ecocast project, which is trying to estimate uh, bycatch risk, uh, so things like uh, you know likelihoods of en uh, encountering turtles and stuff like that. Um, another Southern California misc, uh, forecast of uh, harmful algal blooms in, and um, dian diatomic acid. I forget the exact name. I'm not uh, domoic acid. Yeah, uh, and each of these are, are updated on a daily basis as well. Uh, and then our uh, somewhat ironically, I, I put this slide in before I realized. Uh, the, the folks at Virginia Tech have been running a reservoir fo forecast 
uh, for a reservoir in, in uh, Virginia, uh, operational for a couple of years now. And, and uh, yeah, the thing that's ironic is, is Kay and Carey, the lead PI on this, actually gave a, a, a talk on this on Dur in Durham yesterday that I didn't know about until I saw it on Twitter this morning. Um, so what we're seeing here, let me see if I can redo that an animation. No. Come on. Uh, is a prediction of when the lake is going to overturn. Uh, and they were actually able to pr successfully predict that the lake overturns uh, roughly eight days in advance. Uh, this red line is when it actually did overturn based on uh, you know, the post hoc data. And if you're interested in uh, the biogeochemistry of how lakes works, that's really an important milestone because you know, you're resuspending sediment, you're changing the thermal structure, you know, all of the function of the lake is changing. And if you're a water manager, that's a really important point because all that suspended sediment and, and iron and stuff like that, it's going to totally muck up your filtration system. And, and they need about five days warning to be able to order new chemicals or reroute water from other reservoirs. So that eight day lead time actually changes management on the ground. So this team is actually pushing uh, alerts every single morning to the to reservoir managers who are actually making decisions based on these sorts of forecasts. Um, one of the things that I think is really important uh, here is that uh, unlike the past, this idea of producing ecological forecasts, and particularly the idea of predicting, producing forecasts on, this, on these shorter timescales, uh, is now achievable in a way that it wasn't achievable for previous generations. Uh, as a discipline, we've really seen a, a, a revolution in, in the landscape of the data that's available to us. Uh, driven by changes in sensor technologies and, and observation methods, driven by uh, both top-down and bottom-up uh, development of network science that was not really present to, to previous generations, uh, a, a truly astonishing array of remote sensing capabilities uh, around the world, and, and also to not forget the, the, also the importance of citizen science, often giving us information uh, at times and places that, that no you know, team of motivated technicians could ever cover in, in a feasible grant. Um, you know, so like when we use data from the National Phenology Network and, and phenology forecasts, like there's you know, thousands and thousands of citizen scientists uh, making, you know, responding to, to NPN. And in fact, NPN has started to use their forecasts in their, in their citizen science. So they can actually target alerts to um, communities in spe specific spaces and specific times based on the predicted changes in phenology. So they're, they're getting, they're reminding people to make measurements of the times and places where it's important. <clears throat> so besides making our science more societally useful, I also think that this idea of forecasting is, is fundamentally a win-win for improving the science itself. Uh, I would make the argument that uh, this idea of a forecasting cycle uh, isn't the, the only expression of the scientific method, but it is completely compatible with how we think about how the scientific method works. That you start by you know, forming a hypothesis. Our, our models embody the hypotheses, how we, we think uh, about a system. We make a prediction from those. And when we do so in a forecasting mode, those, for, those predictions are quantitative. They are specific and they are falsifiable. Um, I will say, based on you know my experience as an ecologist, that, that I think we've been letting ourselves off the hook for decades. We you pick up an issue of ecology and you read the hypotheses in a in a paper. I think X will affect Y. What does that mean? If we're feeling bold, I think X will increase Y. That's a strong hypothesis statement right now. You know. I think this plant's going to grow 25% more under this treatment. If it, dro dry, if it grows 20% more, I was wrong, even though both refute the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is dumb in almost everything we're doing because we know it's wrong before we start. And often we are building on decades of research that we know tells us it's wrong, and yet we still keep that same null hypothesis. Um, so this idea of, of being quantitative specific is critical to being falsifiable. Um, the other thing that's really 
uh, uh, an amazing benefit of, of these ideas of forecasting is they force us to be a priori. Uh, you make the forecast before the data exists. It's essentially a form of pre-registration. Uh, it also forces all of our, our, our validation to be out of sample. You're predicting something that hasn't happened yet. Um, it becomes considerably harder to overfit your models when you're testing them against something that hasn't happened yet. We've seen many other disciplines face a crisis of reprodu re reproducibility where you know, large fractions of results that are in, in textbooks fail to replicate. We've not had that day of reckoning in ecology, but we do all the same things that the disciplines that have had that. You know, we, fit, we fit multiple models post hoc, we, f we choose the best one, and we end up with uh, a, a lot of false positives. I think the other thing that's really powerful is, is I, I like to use the idea of weather forecasting as an analogy uh, because one thing it does is it shows that making forecasts for complex environmental natural systems is possible. Uh, and what we saw see is that you know, over the history of numer numerical weather forecasting, the skill has continued to rise steadily. Year after year, they get better. The, you, know, you know, when I was a kid, you could have made jokes about weather forecasts, and if you're older than that, you definitely never trusted the weather forecast. Uh, but it's darn reliable these days. And the other thing you'll note is, is how steady this is. So on, on this particular x-axis are you know, upgrades in major compute power at, at NSEP. You don't see jumps in predictive power when you get bigger computers. If I plotted you know, your satellite data, you know, you don't get big jumps associated with new observation technology. You don't get big jumps associated with upgrades to the model itself. You get a slow and steady, relentless improvement. And I think the reason you get that is every single day, they perform a global experiment. They predict how they think the world works everywhere, and then they observe whether they're right or wrong. And they've done that every single day for over 60 years. That's a lot of feedback about what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. OK, so that was my motivation for uh, why I think we should forecast. Can we forecast? Can you forecast ecology like we forecast weather? Well, what does that mean? And, and to kind of dive into what that means, we're going to have to agree on a definition of how we would even measure what it means to be predictable. So what I'm going to focus on is the idea that if I make a forecast, that forecast is going to have some uncertainty. Remember, I, I took the fact that forecasts are probabilistic as part of the definition of what separates a forecast from just someone running a model. Uh, I'm going to also take it as an axiom that when you make a forecast into the future, the uncertainty will get larger into the future. If you are more confident about the future than you are about the present, you've probably done something wrong should stop. <laughs> um, so that uncertainty is going to grow. And at some point, it's going to do uh, no better than chance. You're going to reach you know, kind of, a, 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 you know, um, you know, kind of the, the equivalent of a climatology. You know, you're, you're doing no better than your historical statistics. And that kind of defines the limit of predictability. So, and if you're lucky, that provides you with forecasts uh, that overlap with decision-relevant timescales. Maybe there are decision-relevant timescales that you can't make predictions at. We don't actually know a priori whether that's going to be true or not. But what we do know is that we can think about what are the things that cause this growth rate? What are the factors that, that affect how quickly the uncertainties increase? If the, un if the uncertainties increase slower, we, we push our forecast limit back. If they increase quickly, our forecast horizon is very limited. And I'm going to argue that I can attribute this growth rate uh, to five things. Um, and so here I'm taking this idea that uh, growth rate is a function of these five things. And I'm um, taking a, a linear approximation of, of the, the variance in the thing I'm forecasting. And I'm attributing this to the internal dynamics of the system how the system responds to external forcings, my ability to constrain the parameters in my model, 
uh, what statisticians call random effects, the, the persistent heterogeneity and variability that we can observe in systems but can't yet explain, um, but, but has pattern, uh, and then process error, which is essentially the remaining residual error in the system after we've accounted for observation error. So I'm, I'm kind of factoring out uh, error associated with the fact that our measurements are imprecise. Each of these five factors follows a, a, a repeating pattern. And so that repeating pattern says that each of these uh, variances has two terms, one associated with uh, the uncertainty in that thing and the other associated with the sensitivity of our forecast to that particular thing. And so in this case, I'm looking at uh, the sensitivity, the uncertainty in the state of the system, which we would call the in initial condition uncertainty, and the, the sensitivity of a system to its internal dynamics, which is the idea of stability. And if, if you're like me, at some point in some ecology class or seminar, you've seen a picture of, of someone drawing a ball rolling off a hill into a valley, or you, that's what I'm talking about, stability. Same thing you learn in intro ecology. Um, so that, that concept uh, is important. But it's also note that there's four other terms. It's not the only thing that's important. Uh, if we go back to weather forecasting as an analogy, in the late 50s, or early 60s, Lorenz was doing some great work at MIT on, on numerical weather models and was able to show uh, this inherent instability in the atmosphere. They, they are chaotic. This is this idea of the butterfly effect. Small perturbations of initial conditions will cause uh, exponentially growing divergent trajectories. Interesting theoretical proof. Interesting theoretical proof that has had tens of billions of dollars of implications. Because everything that NOAA and the other MET services around the world have done to improve weather forecasting is based on understanding that this was the dominant uncertainty in the system, and that if I want to reduce uncertainty in this, I have to minimize uncertainty in that. So all of those weather satellites and radars and stuff like that, they don't exist so that you have a cool app on your phone. They exist to constrain the initial conditions in the atmosphere. That's the reason they exist. That's why they built all of that sensor technology, deployed all those networks of stations. It's to constrain the initial conditions. Um, ecology is interesting. We are trying to become a more predictive si science and not only do we not know what the dominant uncertainty is in our systems, we haven't even asked what uncertainty is driving our systems. And one of the challenges is that, that if I come back uh, here, uh, you can take this all the way to a, a, an exact answer if you know the underlying mechanics of the system, but our systems don't have the same governing rules. So to, to make progress on understanding predictability will require a different approach, um, and I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, also note that, that this first principles framework makes a few other predictions about what we expect about the predictability of ecological systems. Some of them are about the relative importance of different uncertainties. So we expect the relative importance of external drivers to increase with time because the drivers themselves have to be forecasted, and thus their uncertainty has to increase with time. The, um, we expect systems will be more predictable if they are either insensitive to external drivers or there's low uncertainty in those external drivers. So for example, systems that are tightly locked to diurnal cycles, annual cycles, tidal cycles, will have higher predictability because there's low uncertainty in the inputs. Uh, parameter uncertainty will be important in problems that are chronically data limited. Things like invasive species, things like emerging infectious disease, or, or diseases that have high mutation rates like influenza, will always have high parameter uncertainty. Uh, other things we learn are about how we go about modeling our data. So for example, um, to understand that sensitivity to the external environment, we need to know a, a sensitivity, which is a slope. Um, so we don't just need to know that x 
affects y, we need to know how much our x's affect y's. ANOVA designs tell us that x affects y, not how much. Regression designs tell us how much. So if you're designing an experiment and you want to, it to inform a forecast, think about a regression design. Uh, also, that, that heterogeneity and variability, we need to accommodate those random effects even when we can't explain them. Uh, the other thing that's neat about this framework is it's not purely a conceptual one. It's also one that we can apply quantitatively. So here's an example of, of two forecasts where we've partitioned the uncertainties into different sources. Uh, this one is that, that reservoir forecast in Virginia that I showed the animation for earlier. And this is some of our uh, carbon forecasts, so, uh, net ecosystem exchange. And we can see that some of the things we expected hold true. Um, initial condition uncertainty, it, it is small and it drops off exponentially. Many ecological systems, there are ecological systems that are chaotic, but a lot of them have stabilizing feedbacks. Um, we do not have the same forecasting problem as weather forecasters. Um, we see um, the growth of driver uncertainty under time through both. We see kind of an averaging out of process error over time, things like that. So there's some common patterns, but there's also different magnitudes. So to me, one of the exciting questions that has emerged out of this research, oh, this should be doing something. Yes, doing something. Um, is this question of trying to understand the patterns of predictability in ecology. So I currently am thinking about each new forecast that comes online is like a new piece in the puzzle. And if I get enough pieces in that puzzle, we can start looking at the overall patterns. We can understand which sorts of ecological problems are driven by initial conditions, which ones are driven by drivers, which drivers consistently matter for different systems. Um, to, so rather than being able to take this all the way to a, a discrete answer through first principles, I think I'm advocating for what I would call a comparative approach, like you would do as an evolutionary biologist. You have lots of examples and you look to understand the common patterns across space and time and systems. Also note that these are all examples of forecasts that are running uh, now. And also note that not all of them are purely observational systems. So, so this drought experiment, that elevated CO2 by temperature experiment, and this rodent exposure experiment are actually experimental systems that are running forecasts, combining the power of experimental design with the power of forecasting. Uh, in my own lab, uh, we have some funding from NSF Macrosystems, the early NEON program, to start this project of trying to do this comparative analysis of predictability. So we're, we've been starting a couple years into this, and we've been starting to build forecasts for a wide range of different environmental variables in the NEON data catalog, deliberately predict deliberately selected to be as different from each other as possible. Um, and so I've got uh, uh, Catherine Wheeler working on um, phenology forecasting. So that was her animation at the beginning. Uh, Katie Zarada on our, our carbon water fluxes. Uh, John Foster and Shannon Ledoux on our ticks, tick-borne disease, and small mammal hosts. Uh, Kathy Weathers and a team of, of grad students from Gleon, the Global Lake Observatory Network, working on an aquatic productivity and algal bloom forecast. And uh, Colin Averill, Zoe Werbin, and Jenny Bathnagar, who are working on our soil microbial forecasts. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all of these today, so I'm going to dive uh, into two examples to show you kind of where we are right now. Uh, and to show that I actually do science, I just don't pontificate. Um, so here's an example of our carbon flux forecast. And this is similar to that water forecast. It's a system that is set up uh, to run every single day, driven by the weather forecast. And it actually sends you an email every single day with the, the predicted forecast for the next 16 days, as well as retrospective statistics on how, how well the last 16 forecasts were able to predict today. Um, under the hood, we've embedded uh, a, a new version of a, a, a data simulation system that we're calling the Tobit Wishart Ensemble Filter that, is, that represents a, a, a stepping back from the assumptions of traditional data simulation systems developed for weather forecasters and acknowledging that we have different problems and different uncertainties. So the wish art part of this deals with the fact that 
The process error in ecological systems is, is not known a priori. We have to estimate that as we go along. Uh, the toe butt part deals with the fact that a lot of environmental data we face is, is zero bound. I, I can't observe negative biomass. Uh, it's also zero inflated. You know, if I go out to do, um, you know, count species, uh, I'll get a lot more pure absences than I would expect by chance if something was continuously distributed. Um, so we have a system where we are running a probabilistic forecast driven by probabilistic inputs of initial conditions, weather forecasts, and parameters, running it through an ecosystem model to make uh, a forecast. We're then confronting this with observed data from the flux towers on net ecosystem exchange, water fluxes, LE, and then the MODIS LAI, assimilating that into the system and updating the state of the system and, like I said, iterating this every single day. Uh, it's running right now for five eddy covariance towers in Wisconsin. Nothing interesting is happening in Wisconsin right now. It's in the winter. Um, <clears throat> but these include um, a mature hardwood site, a uh, uh, woody wetland, an old growth site, an agricultural site, and then a, a tall tower that integrates kind of over landscape scale variability. I'm going to quickly just look at Willow Creek, the, the mature hardwood site, where we can see how this uh, forecast uncertainty does indeed uh, rise over time. This is our uncertainty when we assimilate the fluxes. If we assimilate the fluxes plus the LAI, uh, on average we gain about a, a day of predictability by adding that second data constraint. Uh, but we also see that our forecast is considerably better at predicting daytime fluxes uh, than it is at nighttime fluxes. So the benefit of the LAI stays fairly constant. Uh, Nighttime's harder. <laughs> uh, by contrast, we don't actually see nearly as much impact of that LAI data on the water fluxes, uh, particularly over the longer term. Uh, the system that we're using to run forward forecasts in real time, we're also using to run hindcasts. Uh, and we're doing this now at a, at a continental scale. Uh, this is picked out one particular site out of that continental scale assimilation happens to be a, 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 a Lobelie Pine uh, clear-cut site here in coastal North Carolina uh, that was actually set up by, by Asko Normitz back when he was uh, here at NC State. And, and you can see what happens is this iterative cycle of making a forecast, making an observation, and uh, the analysis is the update of that forecast based on new data. Here I'm able to constrain it with one thing I do observe, uh, satellite estimates of above ground biomass, uh, but I'm also able to infer through that data simulation things that I don't observe directly, in this case, uh, soil carbon. Uh, and then this is just, this insert is just our, our kind of conus scale uh, map of our, our inferred soil carbon that's indirectly inferred by the processes in the model and these indirect data constraints. Uh, some of the next steps here. We're interested in really expanding the system to more biomes to better understand how the predictability of, of the carbon cycle changes across systems in space and time. And also running the data simulation uh, jointly so that right now we're running each forecast site by site. Uh, but when we do the, the reanalysis, we're actually running it in a way that captures the covariance structure across sites. So this was a, an example of the covariance structure in an earlier prototype that had fewer sites. And we kind of see a strong covariance structure in the west, a strong covariance structure in the east. Uh, who knows what's going on in the Corn Belt? Um, <laughs> um, but it, you know, one of the things we're interested in there is if you have a site that is very data intensive, like a neon site, how far out in space does that information propagate? Is it a kilometer? Is it 10 kilometers? Is it 100 kilometers? How, how far apart are you uh, gaining information? Uh, we're very interested in extending this in time to subseasonal and seasonal drivers, and we're definitely trying to get more constraints in the system, with particular emphasis on trying to better understand plant stress. So things like SMAP, which are soil moisture, um, and uh, vegetal, vegetation optical depth, um, the um, OCO satellite for solar-induced fluorescence, the thermal data from EcoStress, and I'd love to get JETA in at some point as well. Doesn't tell us about plant stress, but you know, tells us about structure. And then just more models. Uh, the other example I wanted to take a, a quick look at is our, our soil microbiome forecasts. Um, 
So here uh, are a number of bacterial functional groups. And here we're looking at uh, the predicted versus observed performance for these models. Uh, all of them have uh, relatively high R squareds. If anyone have, has ever done work with soils, soils are notoriously heterogeneous. You take a soil core here, you move over a few feet, take a soil core there, you get a different answer. Uh, we were astounded that we had any predictability at all. Uh, and I'll also point out that, that these uh, observed data are a true out-of-sample validation. So the, the prediction is based on a, a global data set of, of uh, metagenomic data coming from you know, the global uh, databases uh, of, of soil metagenomic data. And the validation here is out of sample to the NEON sites, so completely different sites uh, than the calibration. And we still get very good predictions. Uh, we also find that predictability increases with scale. Uh, are, are, you know, there's a lot more spread in a core level forecast of an individual soil core than a plot level forecast to a whole neon site. Predictability increases uh, both for functional groups and for uh, taxonomic groups. So as we move up in taxonomic scale, we improve our forecasts. Uh, these figures kind of summarize uh, that here showing um, as uh, the R squareds are improving as we move from a genus to family to order to class to phylum. Uh, interestingly, uh, for bacteria, they keep going up for functional groups. They go, functional groups for fungi are a little bit lower. Um, and this is showing that same breakdown uh, by core, plot, and site. That's just showing that everything's autocorrelated because of course it is. Uh, and one of the things we also notice is that there's a lot better out of sample validation error uh, for the fungi, though we do lose uh, a good bit of predictive power uh, than it is for the bacteria. If we take a, quickly take a closer look at the bacteria, what we actually find uh, is that there's a great correlation between the predictions and the observations. There's just, we end up with systematic biases. And we think this is because uh, bacteria are a lot more sensitive to fairly uh, uh, small differences in, in sequencing techniques and sampling techniques. Fungi tend to be much more robust to the differences in, in the actual uh, protocols used. Um, we're now have, have moved from a, uh, a purely spatial forecast to also now starting to make time series forecasts for the microbiome. <clears throat> and we've also started to include uh, community interactions. So this is uh, a, a map. This happens to be Harvard Forest showing the interactions uh, for both fungi and bacteria. The fungi tend to interact with themselves. The bacteria tend to interact with each other, themselves. Some of these are positive. Some of these are negative. So the red are negative. Blue are positive. So we're now building those kind of uh, community interactions into the forecasts and showing that uh, for both fungi and bacteria, uh, the, the inclusion of, of uh, those, those ecological interactions improves the predictability. OK, home stretch. <laughs> so th that, that's uh, the why, the theory, uh, and the vision. And, and you know, the, can kind of sum up the vision uh, discreetly in terms of uh, the only way we're going to get better at forecasting is to get on this learning curve. It is imperative that as a community we move fairly immediately to making predictions, to putting numbers out there on things before they happen, and seeing how we do and iterating. Um, if we, one of the other lessons from the, the weather forecast was they had a choice back in this point of history. They could have continued to move forward in an iterative mode and learn how they went, or they could have stepped back and tried to improve their models until the models were good enough um, and then started forecasting. They dove in. They made it, they, they went operational, and they learned the problem was a lot harder than they thought. And in fact, that if they had stepped back till the model was better, the model would have never been good enough before the funding ran out. Uh, the whole system would have collapsed on itself. Um, I feel that our discipline has had a tendency to step back. I feel we've been cautious. I feel we've been overly cautious and, and worried that our models aren't good enough. Uh, 
And I would say they, were, they will never be good enough if we don't start making predictions. Uh, the other thing I'll remind us is that while weather forecasts are, are doing quite well now, uh, they, they did stink at the beginning. And we have to be honest in our expectations. We, you know, like, don't expect miracles on day one. You know, it took 60 years of steady progress for this dis that discipline to mature. Um, but it got there, and it got there relentlessly. Um, so the thing that I've been doing to try to help facilitate this is uh, after kind of pu pulling together uh, some folks did a bit of strategic planning, and we, we launched in late 2018 uh, an initiative called the Ecological Forecasting Initiative with the goal of, of better understanding, managing, and conserving uh, the natural world around us through near-term forecasting. Uh, this is a, a bottom-up uh, global uh, consortium with the aim of building a community of practice, of bringing folks together from very different parts of the discipline and, and coming to see each other as part of one community uh, that works together on shared problems. Um, this occurred through a series of, of meetings, you know, starting with 2016 at NEON that led to his PNS paper. Uh, I kind of joke that the, you know, uh, uh, my, my book is the user manual, manual and the PNS paper is the manifesto. Uh, we you know, had a series of meetings, uh, building to uh, a, a large 100 plus person meeting in, in uh, DC this last year, as well as playing a, a, a critical role in, in, in the emergence of, of additional efforts to build community across a, a range of organizations. So we've, we helped USGS organize a workshop. Uh, we helped ne NEON and NCAR organize a joint workshop on forecasting. The American Meteorological Society's Ecological Forecasting Committee and NASA's you know, white, ma white paper roadmap for the future of their forecasting program. Um, under the hood, we've, we've definitely come to learn that uh, it is critical to acknowledge that this is an interdisciplinary effort. Uh, that building ecological forecasts is not just something done by ecologists, but it's something that requires interaction between uh, biological, social, physical, and computational environmental scientists. Uh, it also requires that it not be done in a, uh, by academics in an ivory tower, but the critical importance of engaging stakeholders and, and co-producing forecasts that, that span across academia, agencies, industries, uh, and community science. And these are some of the folks that have been involved in uh, helping to build uh, this, this growing community of practice. Uh, EFI is organized around what we call cross-cutting themes, the things that are shared challenges across the community. Um, so these include <clears throat> things like increasing the diversity of our community, uh, education and training, uh, knowledge transfer is kind of the building these partnerships, theory, this is that kind of that comparative analysis, social and decision science, translating uh, forecasts into things managers can use, and the underlying technological tools that make it possible, the methods in cyber infrastructure. Uh, on the educational side, um, there's a book. Um, <laughs> there's a, the web page will tell you about a um, growing list of universities that offer courses in forecasting, most of whom make their syllabi open, uh, papers, other things like that. We also run uh, a short course in ecological forecasting. The application window for this just closed, unfortunately, though I do know a couple of you did apply. Um, also let you go to cool places, like we, we ran the course on an island in a fjord in Norway this fall. That was fun. Um, uh, on the cyber infrastructure side and methods side, um, we think that this, these sorts of efforts on the technological side are really critical um, to kind of achieving an economy of scale. So right now, current efforts to build ecological forecasts are largely cottage efforts. The, you know, we, we kind of joke that uh, these are artisanal forecasts. Each team builds it and they build their own workflow and they are things that require a lot of technical expertise. And that expertise is usually beyond the training of the average ecologist. You know, we don't have degrees in software engineering or informatics or you know, system automation and stuff like that. 
So it's a lot of work to bring one of these things into operations uh, because we keep doing this independently. We think that if we instead think about working as a community to build shared tools, uh, to develop open standards, uh, to apply common analytical methods and, and develop open public archives. Uh, this will help us achieve this economy of scale, uh, will help make these tools more accessible, flattening the learning curve will get more people involved, uh, and this critical role of interoperability which allows us uh, to reuse tools rather than reinventing wheels. Uh, and then there's this role of decision science. Like I said, this is not just a question of making better forecasts. You know, the, the if you build it, they will come model does not work. Uh, you need to engage stakeholders from the beginning. And we, we were thinking about things like how you uh, elicit expert knowledge and aggregation, so br building the expert knowledge into the forecasts, improve the understanding of forecasts, how they're interpreted and used in decision makings, uh, in de developing new prescriptive approaches about how forecasts uh, can, can be used in decision making. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of deeply mathematical theory on how you do you know, decision making under uncertainties. Uh, but there are some, I think, I interesting, unique challenges that uh, ecological forecasts bring here to this discipline uh, that is going to be useful for us and for them to understand decision making. Uh, so to kind of sum up the key messages, uh, iterative prediction. Prediction should be quantitative, specific, falsifiable, made a priority, and thus able to be validated out of sample. This is going to make our science better, more robust, stronger. We will learn more, and we will learn more faster. Um, there's this brilliantly huge, going to use the rest of my career and many, many other people's careers, question of understanding the patterns of predictability in nature. I think it's a, to me it's a grand challenge, a real idea uh, that, that gets me just fundamentally excited about trying to step back from the silo that I've spent most of the last 20 years in and re-engage with the whole discipline. You know, I've, dealt, I've, I've worked with aquatic ecologists and marine ecologists and disease ecologists in ways that I had never done before and realizing that, you know, you know, can we look for these patterns? Is our field something more than a collection of case studies? Do we understand the overarching patterns that makes ecology ecology? And then this important effort to try to build a community of practice, that we don't build these things ourselves, that we work together. And, and to me, it's just been exciting because I think it is a community that's reaching a tipping point where, where I think things are going to uh, really move forward quickly from here. Uh, how to get involved. Uh, Effie runs uh, one-stop shopping. Most important is our website, ecoforecast.org. Uh, there you can sign up for our newsletter. If you do nothing else, you know, that will go out uh, four to eight times a year telling you what we're up to, what's coming up next. Obviously, we're on Twitter and stuff. I want to definitely let folks know that uh, Effie got uh, NSFRCN funding this year. We will be we have funding for uh, community building workshops over the next five years, and one of the core parts of that is this neon forecasting challenge. So at our at our kickoff meeting this May uh, at Neon's headquarters, we're going to be de deciding on a, a subset of e neon variables that we're going to try to forecast as a community. And it's going to be an open science call, kind of like a data science competition, uh, where anyone from any university or non-academic entity can develop a forecast, submit their predictions, and we'll see how we're doing. We'll learn a lot about making predictions. We'll, learn a, we'll try to build standards, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll make some synthesis papers. Uh, and it's an open effort. That said, if you want to attend that meeting, uh, application window closes in uh, less than two weeks. Uh, about a week. Uh, and then there's also you know, information on our webpage about memberships and projects. There's a Slack channel. There's working groups, a student group. Um, yeah, and again, my final call, the importance of, of uh, getting started, that we're only going to get better by doing this. Thanks, you all. And uh, I guess I don't have time for any questions. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. I'm wondering if you've done anything like that yourself, or if you know anyone else in Etsy who might be very similar. I, I, I have not done stuff like that. I am still on the, the early parts of the learning curve when it comes to, to the social and decision science side of this. But I am, uh, uh, I think the important step I've made is, is to, to acknowledge my own ignorance and not come in as, an, air, as a, an arrogant natural scientist assuming that I somehow know something because I know math. Um, and and uh, to try to build that team. So one of Effie's working groups is this social and decision science working group that is trying to pull together folks in that part of the community who are, are the social and decision scientists who are interested in uh, uh, how forecasts can be used uh, in environmental decision making. The, the lead of that team is, is Melissa Kinney at uh, University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment, uh, who's you know, really made her whole, whole career around environmental uh, decision science. Uh, and there's actually a whole great group of folks in this area at the Institute of the Environment in Minnesota. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a broad working group. I will say the, uh, well, Effie is international due to time zone reasons. The, the working group calls tend to be biased towards North America. You know, the Australians are finding it harder to make our calls. <laughs> and we've never generously decided to hold a call at 3 a.m. so that they can participate. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Could you talk to us a little bit about the challenges of communicating like that? Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. I mean that that's that's a great challenge and it, it's I think fraught with landmines. And again, also a, a great example for why it's really important to engage uh, with, with social and decision scientists who understand uh, much more than, than most of us about the, the, the cognitive biases and heuristics that lead to people inherently misinterpreting probabilities. Uh, and also just the linguistic challenges that uh, to the average person, uncertainty means you guessed. Um, well, in fact, for me, uncertainty is, is the hard part. It's the part that, that I grind uh, uh, away at relentlessly to get the best possible quantifications of those uncertainties. I put more work into the quantification of the uncertainties than the quantification of the mean, I think, sometimes. Um, uh, that said, I, I do think there are, are rays of hope. Um, one thing that I've always found, uh, well, I mean, since its existence, I've always found very encouraging are things like the, the 538 blog. And these are folks that, that make highly sophisticated Bayesian models and in a public blog will post full Bayesian posteriors of things. And maybe not everyone really gets what they're doing, uh, but they express it in a language that takes all the technical parts away. And uh, given the popularity of those, there's clearly, um, they're not pitching it to the lowest common denominator, but, but it is pitched so that that inform people are able to use and make sense and, and you know, uh, learn things from, from those efforts. Um, I also think that part of Effie's educational plan is not just focused on um, our own community. I think that uh, you know, communicating to uh, end users and stakeholders what these uncertainties are, what they mean, how to use them is, is an important part of the educational mission we have. In fact, you know, we think, uh, I would say, uh, my version of this educational mission started with the, uh, the, the, uh, the most technical end of this spectrum, the folks that would actually want to know how to build a forecast. But I think it needs to, to trickle down. I think you know, every graduate student needs to have some understanding of how forecasts work, even if they don't make a forecast, knowing things like the, the point about uh, regression designs, you know, things that you can do to make your own data more accessible to forecasters. Things like data latency is also really important. The delay between when you collect data and when you make it available. Um, oh, shoot, what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, and we, we also think it needs to go down to the undergraduate level, uh, that every, every intro ecology class could be taught with uh, an understanding of the predictive components of ecology. And there's actually a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, across 
STEM science as a whole, that those sort of like real world case studies uh, are really important for engaging folks and, and retaining folks in, in, in STEM careers. I, I was talking to the, the students over lunch and saying, you know, if, if we were as a discipline able to uh, grab, you know, 1% of the computer science majors, 1% of the physics and stats and math majors, you know, not all of them, but grab you know, a tiny fraction that can be convinced that saving the world is more important than making the next widget. Um, <laughs> that, that would be incredibly helpful to all of us uh, to, to kind of you know, in, engage with, with uh, yeah, that th this is interdisciplinary and it requires that that educational mission is, is broad and, and yeah, trained. So I've gotten kind of off track from the uncertainty question. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it is tough. Um, yeah. So it seems like most of your models are mechanistic. Um, do you use artificial intelligence or do you see <laughs> challenges with sort of black box artificial intelligence that maybe you don't even understand really how you got there? Yeah. Or maybe get a more accurate forecast? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And, and it comes up almost every seminar. And uh, I will say that, that it, it's interesting because I will, uh, among the core group that, that came together to launch EFI, uh, on 95% of what I've presented today, there is complete uh, unanimous consent, consensus on what the mission is. And when you, you, when you open the question of machine learning, suddenly the divergence of opinions in all, all possible directions among, among fairly informed people. Um, yeah, it, it is tough. Uh, I tend to use mechanistic models. Uh, I tend to think that if you're extrapolating uh, beyond the range of the data, it gives you more confidence uh, that, that those sort of data mining methods can go really crazy when you get outside of the range of the data. Uh, I think, to me, having models that embed hypotheses is kind of key to that synergistic win-win between making predictions and testing hypotheses. If, if, if your model doesn't represent a hypothesis, you only get half of that win. Uh, that said, there are places where getting the forecast right is far more important in the short term than testing your hypothesis. And yeah, there's an argument to be made that these machine learning approaches can get you there quicker, particularly if you, if you are careful to stay kind of in sample. Uh, but even the, some of the folks that are, are the biggest advocates for this, you know, uh, you know I've, I've, we, we've had uh, folks from like George Sergi Sugihara's lab who've done some of the empirical dynamic models, who, who will also say that like if, if we want to make a longer term projection, even they're going to, you know, go back to a mechanistic model, because uh, you know the, those phase spaces only work within the uh, when you stay within those assumptions within that original domain. Uh, but but you know, even as someone who loves mechanism, I also think that there's opportunities to leverage machine learning as well. So like the, the models I run on the carbon cycle, you know, I'm I'm generating, you know, half hourly output at thousands and thousands of grid cells across large spatial domains for multiple state variables. And if I want to assess how that model's predict behaving, a predicted observed plot is not going to tell me what's going on if it's got, you know, a million data points on it. Uh, so I've been th playing with things like using data mining of not the data, but of the residuals of the model to try to understand where are the persistent biases in our current understanding. So I think there are uh, lots of places where there are, are potential synergies uh, between these approaches, and it's not, uh, increasingly it's not becoming an either or. I think there's an, an emerging set of machine lurking approaches that allow you to uh, embed uh, assumptions more firmly and, and constraints more firmly. <laughs>